So, hi everybody that has joined. Um, my name is Carmel Tavori. I am one of our sales development directors here at Demandbase. And today I'm joined with Reva Pellerin, who is one of uh, their account executives at Vidyard. And I also have Risa Kamsi, an account executive at Stacked Overflow. Um, we are going to be talking today about tips for up and coming sales professionals. So before we jump in, I would love to pass it over to each of you, let you introduce yourselves, maybe give some background on what kind of brought you into sales, and then we can jump into the different questions. So I guess Riva, I'll pass it over to you first. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. Nice to be here. I'm going to probably close my blinds after I do this intro. Um, so I am a strategic account manager at Vidyard, and I've been with Vidyard for just over seven years. Um, previous to that was an account executive at Oracle. So I've been selling marketing tech and sales tech for a number of years now and super excited to be part of this uh, LinkedIn Live. Awesome. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm Risa. I'm an account executive at Stack Overflow. I also am a part-time SDR trainer at a boot camp called Trainio. And then I also do some like kind of freelance consulting work on the side. So <laughs> I've always kind of had three jobs. So that's kind of what I'm up to these days. I love it. I'm excited to hear the different perspectives of how that ties into some of the different questions we have lined up today. Um, amazing. So I guess let's get started with like the foundation. Like how did each of you get into sales originally? What drew you in? I feel like this is usually a winding road for most people. So um, yeah, how did you guys get here? Yeah. Do you want to go first, Risa? No, you can go ahead, Rita. Um, so yeah, I got into sales. It was an interesting way in. I was in recruiting after I graduated um, and I was doing my MBA part time. And a friend of mine was at Oracle as a business development rep who I had done my MBA and my undergrad with. And he asked if I'd be interested in interviewing for Oracle. And I thought like, what? I was so naive. I like, didn't know what sales was. And I, I was like, but we're not engineers. Why would we work at Oracle. I'm so confused. And so he was like, no, it's like a cold calling role. Like, and I was just like, so blown away. I did not know this type of career existed. So I was like, okay, sure. I'll interview. And that so it's kind of just a random decision to interview. And so I, I was in the business development role. I was on a track for like BDR leadership. And at the 11th hour, I, um, a VP of sales approached me and I was like, oh, can I do sales? I don't know. I've never considered myself a salesperson, but I took that role and the rest is history. I guess I've always been in sales since. That's amazing. Yeah. So I actually got into sales kind of out of necessity. I was a waitress for about seven years. I, I had graduated college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. So I had just been working in nightlife and then lost both of my jobs in March of 2020 due to COVID. I was in the Bay Area at the time, so everything shut down for 16 months. And in that first couple months, I was like, okay, I can sit here and feel sorry for myself or I can learn a new skill. And one of my colleagues actually from Nightlife, she was a bartender, she was at that point in time a director of marketing at a cloud security company. So I called her up and I was like, hey, like, how did you transition from nightlife to tech and how are you doing what you're doing? And she's like, if you're serious about this, I will tell you exactly what to do. And if you follow these steps that I give you, you will get a job in tech and you'll start as an SDR. So I did exactly what she told me to do. I did a boot camp. Um, I did interview prep with her and then she got me hired. So it's awesome. That's incredible. I love that both backgrounds are different, but like brought you to a similar space. And I just think like that's one of the best things about sales too, is like, it's not about where you're coming from. It's about your work ethic, your drive, you know, what you bring to the table and anybody can really make that work for themselves if they're willing to put the hustle in. So that's awesome. I guess following up on that, since both of you have such like different experiences and, you know, are now here, 
I'm sure there's a lot of lessons you've learned along the way. Maybe you wish you knew when you started and things that you're kind of learning every day that optimize the way that you work. I would say first, what do you think is maybe the most valuable thing that you've learned so far? And maybe also like as a follow-up to that, what do you feel you wish you knew when you started? It's a really good question. <laughs> um, I feel like for me, um, the number one thing that I've learned is how to and this is something I'm still working on, but like manage my stress levels and not worry so much about what's going on with like my deals and stuff and rather just kind of stay on top of things. And so take the emotion out of what mm -hmm. I'm doing at work, because obviously we're as humans, we are emotional and we're going to get stressed if things aren't going right or whatever. Um, but then keeping in mind that that stress isn't going to help me make anything progress or really help me or serve me at, at the end of the day at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think just like focusing on trying to kind of keep that fight or flight kind of response at bay and just be like, mm -hmm. okay, I can logically identify what's going on here. I know that I'm under pressure to do X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to accomplish it by doing X, Y, and Z. And I'm not going to just sit here and worry about the outcomes because I'm taking care of business no matter what. Totally. Was that something that was passed on to you as well when you were prepping for your interviews originally and like making that transition? Um, I think, no, I think that's just something I've kind of like learned like throughout being an SDR and an AE mm -hmm. because even with, I was so stressed out at my first SDR role. I was only making like $40,000 a year and I was working like 12 hour days because I was so stressed about doing a good job. And when I think about that now, I'm like, what was I even thinking? So I think just like managing my stress levels and then learning how to manage time, like time management have been like my biggest things throughout my career. Yeah, I would say that mine are sort of on the same wavelength. The first, the thing I wish I knew, but you kind of can't get there unless you go through it, I feel. Um, what I wish I knew starting my career is that there are many ways to be good at sales. When I started 10 years ago, it's still very male dominated, but I was like often the only girl or one of a couple girls on a team. And so the people that you look up to, the people who are on the top of the leaderboard or the loudest personalities are often these men who are in a very similar cookie cutter type uh, person, to put it blunt bluntly. And so it was tough, like trying to emulate them and like not feel like I was them at all, like very aggressive. They would, they were great golfers. They read about the economy. They like were into finance and investing. And I was like, I can't have these conversations. I don't watch sports. Like I, I don't build rapport with my clients like that. I must not be good at sales or I must not have the skills to be good at sales. And, um, it was only like after like years of being in sales and like sort of questioning, like there were many years where I was like, hey, I got to get out of it after this quarter. Like this isn't the career for me. And mm. I'm not sure exactly what switched. I think it was a little bit of maturity, a little bit of like building my confidence that made me realize there's not one way to do sales and actually B2B sales is it's always evolving. But what you'll see a lot right now is that it's evolving into this. The, the better salespeople are the ones that build really deep relationships, really understand their customer, really come to every meeting with value. And that's the type of sales rep I strive to be. Not necessarily someone who's going to talk to you about a basketball game or know what you're talking about with certain topics. Um, but and so I feel comfortable now in this career, whereas before I didn't. So I wish I knew that there was multiple ways to be successful in sales. And um, something that I have learned in terms of like getting through, I don't know if this is the answer to the second part of that question, but times are tough in sales right now. Times are probably tough for people that are on this live stream. I know it's tough for me, but knowing it's so cliche that this too shall pass is helpful. 
helpful even for mental health. I don't know if anyone suffers with anxiety or depression, but like once you've gone through it like seven or eight or nine times, you realize like I've been here before and Mm -hmm. also I get through it and it feels better. And that's the same with sales. Like when you go through low times, just being able to catch yourself and be like, I've been here before. And I know that if I do X, Y, Z and focus on this and be kind to myself, next quarter is going to look totally different. So that kind of gives you hope in these like dark moments of sales. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I love a few of the things you just said. First, I kind of wanted to dive into um, this idea of how like not all sales looks the same. Couldn't agree more. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, from my perspective, looking at the way that we coach our BDRs, like that's something that we harp on a lot, like really putting your personality into it and breaking through the noise and being creative. What are ways that you double down on building that relationship to really like be authentic to yourself through a sales cycle? Because I I feel like there's a lot of ways to do that, but what has really like helped you stay grounded in that and propel your sales and deals forward? Yeah. So I think it's a mix of like knowing when you can take something from someone else's process and incorporate it into your own. And when you can say that's great for them, but it's something that I can't do authentically. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, for instance, like Vidyard is a product led growth organization. So something I do a lot and find a lot of success in is talking to the the AEs and the BDRs who might use our product in my customers and learn about like, how do you use us? Like, what do you get from us? Do little interviews with them to collect their, their stories mm-hmm. and then like bubble that up to leadership. Other people might be, and you know, there's like a time and place for both, but other people might not like doing that type of work. I like doing that work because it makes me feel really like prepared and aware of what's going on. So like a bit of context, I have a very small book of business. I work with like 20 customers. And one thing I love about that is I think I'm the type of sales rep who really likes to intimately understand a customer. Mm -hmm. And so like collecting those sound bites, even though not every rep on my team likes to do that work, they might find it a little bit of a waste of time or not even a waste of time, but just like, I don't see the output of that. Whereas that's something I love to do and I find it super helpful. So that's just one example. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like you're really putting yourself in the position of being like a strategic consultant. And I think people really gravitate towards that in a, in a sales process. Um, for both of you, you, uh, Reva just mentioned, like it is tough times in sales right now. Everyone is going through it. Um, what are ways that you both are focusing on, kind of fighting through that. I know that you both touched on this in our ebook and talking about how you're selecting specific accounts. You're trying to really double down on them during these tough times. But can you give us a little bit more on like what that means to you? Is there a process that you're following? Is a certain workflow, the way that you're communicating with these accounts, like how is that looking for you? For me, um, me and my manager just started doing like a regular pipeline review. So we've, we always have like forecasting calls where the team will talk about their deals and what's kind of happening with them. But we just started syncing regularly and just like going through each opportunity I have and saying like, okay, what was the last step you took? What's your next step? Or if they went dark, like what are a couple things we could do? But I'm trying everything, you know, like anything you can think of we're, we're doing, like we're troubleshooting, like, multi-threading, reaching out, like building groundswell by reaching out to ICs and like bubbling these issues up to leadership or decision makers. Um, we're, we're just trying a lot of different things. And so, um, yeah, I think just that has been the most helpful thing for me is like meeting with my manager one-on-one and just going through each opportunity and making sure that like we're on top of it and doing everything we can to bring it in this quarter. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that for me, so like a few pieces of advice, it depends on what your book of business looks like. If you have like a massive book of business, you have like hundreds of accounts, I would really recommend if you haven't already going through a bit of like a tiering process in your accounts. So really understanding where your product shines, what your ICP is, and then zoning in on ICP because you don't have the 
bandwidth to be wasting your time on deals that aren't going to close. So number one, tier your accounts based on where you're most likely to win. Um, the second piece would be using LinkedIn data or other data. I, I know, for instance, at Vidyard, a couple things that matter to me are, are you in our ICP and how many sellers do you have for, from a licensing perspective? So I would be going to LinkedIn, documenting those numbers, and then organizing my account list. And then from like a Vidyard data perspective, I'm looking at things like, and if people are listening and they're in a product like growth world, or you might have other intent data, if you're using like a platform like Demandbase, taking that into consideration and tiering your account so that you have a good idea of like, what accounts are showing intent, what accounts have XYZ crossed off that make them a really good candidate and cut all the other noise out, figure out a way to be more, automated in those lower tiered accounts and then hyper-focused on your big ones because that's just going to increase your chances of closing deals. But also when you tier your accounts that way, you can close bigger deals in those bigger, those better accounts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the combination of like being organized and being really diligent and meticulous about where each opportunity lies, like who needs additional support? Who do you need to further communicate with as well as understanding like what is our best fit account? Where do I need to really like personalize and be you know more strategic versus what is less likely to be a fit for our business? I'm biased coming from demand base for sure, but like <laughs> you know, it, it works. It really makes such a difference. And I love that you're both, you know, touching on both sides of the spectrum. Cause I think understanding your account list is such an important piece to understanding where to optimize your time. But then also like beyond that, do you need to bring in additional resources? Do you need to pull an exec in somebody else to help you like move the deal along? So totally agree. I think those are great points. Um, I would say in addition to that, kind of on the same line of this, you know, economic situation that we're facing and just figuring out the best way to get through the quarter, what are ways that you guys are avoiding burnout? Because I feel like that's very real in the sales world and it's it's a lot of hours and maximizing your time during the workday and kind of shutting off outside of it. What are the things that you guys are doing to, you know, put your best foot forward every day? For me, it's like just putting myself first. Like my job is obviously a hugely important thing to me. Um, and I always want to work extremely hard, but you're only valuable to your company if you're like actually mentally healthy and rejuvenated. And so um, I think like it's really important to shut off your laptop at five or six or whatever you are normally supposed to end your work day. Um, if you're focused during those business hours, like you can get everything you need to get done. It's just like staying focused and then having the boundary of like, okay, I'm shutting this off and I'm going to yoga or whatever, however it is you decompress. I think also like prioritizing that non-screen time. Like I, I'm definitely careful about like, okay, I just got off work. I'm not going to try and watch TV instantly or like be on my phone. I want to like go do something that doesn't involve a screen and then I can maybe come back and watch uh, a movie or something. But that's been the most helpful for me. I sometimes suck, often suck at dealing with burnout. Um, again, I'll go back to that, that comment I made where like once you've been through it enough times, you start to identify like, oh, OK, I've done this before and I need to do something different. Or you just become aware of like, a pattern you may have been in. Um, one thing I've done this year is invested in a mental health coach for work, which has been helpful. He's given some like tactical tips on how to identify when burnout's coming. Cause at the beginning of burnout, actually like the first phase of burnout is called like the honeymoon phase where it actually feels kind of good. Um, but like now I'm kind of aware of that. And I realize that that might be leading to a bad situation. And um, I, would say that right now what I'm doing is I've like, for instance, deleted LinkedIn and Slack and my work email off my phone because I found I was just kind of checking it unnecessarily as we all do and having it not on my phone has made my phone 
extremely uninteresting because I don't have a lot of social media on it. So like it just kind of forces you to put the phone away. Um, but I think to just right now in this state of the economy, like sometimes it can feel like you're banging your head against the wall. And so I'm trying to give myself some grace on like days where I just don't feel like putting in a hundred percent, like, okay, then I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. going to put in a hundred percent. I'm going to take a little a few hours off in the afternoon, or I'm going to do some work that's like super non-priority, but it makes me feel like I'm getting a little bit done because that's what I have the energy for today. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to like read your mental space. Like if you can't do that big task on your to-do list, then just maybe don't do it today. Maybe tomorrow is the day to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Could you tell us a little more about like the um, signs of burnout? Like you talked a little bit about the honeymoon phase and like what else are things that you've picked up on that maybe other people are overseeing and are just feeling like, I know for me, I I'm sure that there are moments where I'm probably doing those things and I'm just like, just got to power through. Like it's just part of the day, you know, whatever. Yeah. I don't, I would definitely recommend everyone look up the signs of burnout and the stages of burnout. I think there's like five stages, but I don't know all of them, but things that I have identified in myself is one feeling like you hate your job. You want to quit your job. You hate your career. And again, I've gone through that like five or six times where I can catch myself. And I'm like, I probably don't hate my career. I'm just not having a great time right now. And like, let's take a step back and figure out what's going on. Oh, it's really tough to sell right now. Oh, I lost two big deals. That feels crappy. And like, take everything with the context of what's happening um, and don't make any rash decisions on it. But then maybe just understand that maybe you need to take some time off or maybe you need to get into a hobby again that you've stopped doing because you've focused too much on work or something like that. You just have to kind of course correct. Um, I think another uh, symptom that I relate to is apathy or like feeling like you don't really care. Mm -hmm. um, so like, who cares if I send this email out with this error or I'm not going to prep for this call or you, this just like this feeling of like low energy towards your job where once you may have felt like super passionate about it. So those types of things, if you feel like that's happening, might be burnout and not necessarily you wanting to leave your career yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think being aware of those signs is so important. On the flip side for the both of you, is there anything that you do when you have those moments? Maybe that's more like process related or conversations you've had with your leadership team or your other colleagues that kind of like when you're in those moments of either panic or stress or burnout, what kind of process or conversations bring you back to if I stick to this like I know this is going to get me through it and maybe other people can kind of hear that and apply that to their work day I would say a big one for me is like having people at work that you trust as like someone that you can be like really open with that like understands that you're not necessarily like you can vent your emotions and they're not going to judge you for it. And they might not try to solution your issue right away. They just are like there to listen. Mm -hmm. I have a couple people, like, like I, I have a number of people who I can do that with, who I can trust with my emotions. I can trust they're maybe going through something similar or they have, or they will be. That's number one, find someone that you can confide in. And particularly like someone who has your job because that's always helpful. Um, but also just being like emotionally aware of where you are. Like I know just being able to tell my husband, for instance, like I feel like I'm burning out from my role or I feel like I'm really unmotivated at work right now. And that's making me feel like a crappy person because nothing's going right at work and I feel really unmotivated. And then the day ends and I feel like I'm bringing that into our family time and just like speaking that out and letting someone know, and then they can be like, give you a bit of grace or figure out a way to like, okay, like let's put our phones away. Let's, do something special tonight, right? So just being aware of your emotions, open with your emotions, um, that helps a lot. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Um, going off of, I mean, to your point, Reva, like just acknowledging what's happening is really important and being open and honest with like, yeah, your partner, 
your boss, like anyone that, you know, it's relevant to, like, I, I think even today I just told my manager, I was like, yeah, this is really stressing me out, like what's going on with these deals. But, um, you know, just still staying on positive as much as possible on top of that. But also um, it's really great because um, Stack Overflow gives us like $150 a month stipend for like wellness or, you know, like a gym or whatever. And so something that are always stressed me out before was like spending money on like too much money on a gym or whatever. So it like worked out perfectly. I started doing unlimited yoga at this amazing studio. And now I just funnel all my stress and frustration mm -hmm. and preoccupation into those classes. And so I think just really like, yeah, expressing yourself calmly and openly and then also having an outlet. is just so important. Like, yeah, incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got to have somebody that you can talk to. I love the yoga. Um, that's super awesome that you guys have a stipend for that. Um, I think we are close to time. So I'll ask you guys one final question on the whole topic of tips for people who are coming into sales or maybe are doing it already. I guess just to like round it out. Yes, times can be tough. Burnout is real. Understanding it is super important. But in the end of the day, this is the career that you chose. And no matter what, it sounds like the both of you do come back to it. And there's something that pulls you in. What would you, if you could put your finger on one of that, what, what does that look like for you? I think I might like say, there's like ups and downs in sales. If you do feel like it's not for you and you're like, <laughs> you have to like be objective about it, right? If you're like, I really don't like this. It's not that you're burnt out and apathetic. It's like, this isn't a good fit. Then like have the courage to, to jump out. Maybe it's something adjacent to sales or maybe it's something totally different. Um, but keeping, uh, this is my biggest tip to people because I'm doing it right now. And so it's like a good reminder in hard times, like right now, like there is still so much in your power. There, it's really easy to be like, it's a downturn in the economy and my territory sucks. That ends up like making you feel even worse because it's like, well, what can I do? I just have to sit here and wait for things to get better. Whereas there's so much in our control and like feeling empowered can make you feel so much better and hopeful. So just doing the, the minimum things, getting your inputs in, getting your calls in, getting your emails in, coming prepared to those, those calls that you have scheduled. Um, because eventually this is going to turn around in the way, what I keep telling myself is when this does turn around, I want to be in such a good position to close all these deals I've been working on. And I don't want to be kicking myself for having given in to like, what, what can I do in this time? So keep doing your daily, like what you need to do to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think for me, it's like making sure I'm using these challenges as learning moments. So like, to give you an example, like, you know, three different things went wrong with big deals this week and each of them were kind of like completely different from the next. Mm -hmm. But now moving forward, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this differently next time. And I'm going to do this differently next time. And I honestly feel like it's, it's also possible to just still feel grateful for like, for example, I'm a fully ramped AE and like one of the hardest like economic situations right now since like, I mean, 2008 was probably worse, but you know, it's just, it is a little bit challenging right now. So if I can be somewhat good now, like I can be amazing in a good economy and just like keeping that in mind because, you know, I see people around me struggling. I know other people at other companies are struggling. And so I think it's good to speak that out loud and just be like, okay, what can I learn from these challenges moving forward? Absolutely. I think both of the things you just each said is so powerful. First of all, taking ownership and really understanding that like there is a lot in your control. I always say this to the BDRs that I work with, like control what you can control. You can control the outreach, the communication, the the way that you are, you know, supporting these accounts, there is a lot that we can do to set ourselves up for success and a hundred percent like 
not giving in to a tough time just because it's tough. Like, doesn't mean that you can't put in the work to, you know, have the extra call, have the extra email, whatever it may be, pulling in other resources and getting strategic is so important. And also to having gratitude a hundred percent, like tough times do pass and we're all, you know, lucky to be here and giving it a hundred percent that you can give it sometimes is all that you can do. And if you are doing what you can to like control what's in your power and leaving the rest to kind of just figure itself out, like sometimes that's the most that you can do. And I think just practicing gratitude every day is wildly important and goes a lot further than than you think. I always say like what you put out in the universe comes back. So I love that. Um, I would leave time for Q&A, but I'm not seeing a lot of comments, but I guess we'll give it like a minute or two just to see if any other comments pop up. Um, in the meantime, either of you have any final thoughts or comments that you want to put out there before we wrap it up? Just thank you for having us. Yeah. Chatting with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. This has been so fun. Thank you both for joining today. Um, like I said, I'm not seeing any comments pop up right now with questions, but if any other questions come floating in, you know, we'll be sure to get back to those people. But thank you both so much for joining. I had a great time and I hope you did too. And hopefully anybody that um, tuned in today got to learn from each of you and um, can apply that in their work day. Yes. Love it. It was awesome. nice to be here. Yes. Thank you guys. Have a great day. You too. You too.